Father, we're so grateful to you that peace has arrived in this Advent season, Father, that one of those arrivals, your son, represents the peace, which we will talk about today. So, Father, as we do that and as we go through the scriptures that you've given to us, Father, would you just make clear to us, make plain to us what you want us to know today and um, bless the message as it is given. Father, use my voice, but all, as always, Father, it is you that we want to be taught from today. Send your son, Jesus, to move, us, to move our hearts. It's in the name of Jesus we pray and thank you for this blessing. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone, and happy Sunday to you. It is Sunday, December 5th, and I hope that this message is uh, finding you well and safe. Uh, I am Pastor Grant Forsyth, and uh, welcome to In His Grace Community Church. We are, there we go, <laughs> giving some, uh, there we go, having some technical fun today. Hey, uh, like I mentioned in the prayer, uh, our, our theme today uh, for Advent, we're in the second week of Advent, is peace. And every year we use those themes of hope, peace, joy, and love, and every year I I search for creative ways that we can um, uh, learn about those so that it's not the same thing every year because it isn't the same thing. It's always something new. Whenever you're in Scripture, whenever you're in God's Word, there's always something new, even if it's something you've read a hundred times. All right? That's what's so neat and exciting about God's Word. So we uh, represent peace today with our Advent candles of hope from last week, as you recognize that perhaps, and the second candle representing peace, uh, the peace of Christ. So what are we talking about when we're talking about peace? Um, because the word peace can actually be used in a variety of ways. A uh, hope is a little more specific because we're talking about something we haven't received yet, but yet we hope for it. We have evidence that it is coming, and so we have hope for it. With peace, we use peace um, in more than one way, and, and I want to take a look at that today because they all apply, whichever way we look at it. They all apply to the arrival of Jesus. Peace is among us, right? And I want to talk to you uh, from the story of Luke chapter 1. Um, Luke and Matthew are the two Gospels that give us a limited number of details about Christ's birth. Um, and so Matthew is a little bit more about, since it's uh, directed to the Jewish population of the church, it's a little bit more about fulfilling prophecies. Jesus is king. He's the promised one from King David. So as you go through the story, that is emphasized starting with the genealogies, of course, um, because Jesus is to be the son of David. So they go through the genealogies first. And then, of course, it moves to Joseph and Joseph's dream and then on to the Magi. So it's all kind of related about Jesus being king. Luke is a little bit more about uh, the experience with Mary, uh, the angel visit to Mary, um, uh, of course, her visit to uh, her relative Elizabeth and Elizabeth's husband, Zachariah. And that's where we're starting right now, actually, with not the birth of Jesus, but the birth of John, who would become John the Baptist, which is another miraculous birth, by the way. 
uh, another angel visit to Zechariah to tell him his wife would be pregnant even though they are way past childbearing years. So there's kind of a miracle there. And the other thing that happened in the story is that Zechariah didn't believe the angel. Um, he wanted some kind of a sign. So his, uh, the result of that is that Zechariah was unable to speak during the entire pregnancy until John the Baptist, John, the baby John, was born, and then Zechariah got his speech back. And when he started to speak, he began, in Scripture, what was explained to us, he began to prophesy. Yes, to prophesy. Um, and he begins his prophecy not with his son John, but with Jesus, who isn't born yet. John has been born, but Jesus is another six months down the road before he will be born. But it's interesting that Zechariah starts his prophecy about the coming Jesus. All right, so we pick it up here in verse 68. It says, this is Zechariah prophesying. He's saying, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. Redeemed them. That's what Jesus is coming to, to, to do, to redeem, obviously, Israel, but really the whole world. And uh, Zechariah is speaking this as if it's already happened. He has come to his people and redeemed them. He's already looking at the fact that even though Jesus isn't born yet, he is the redeemer. He is the one to come. All right? And Zechariah is celebrating that, which is kind of neat because... His child, John, has just been born. Jesus has not been born yet. He has raised up a horn of salvation. That's a common uh, phrase, or, or the horn is a common symbol in, in, uh, in that culture. A horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. So Zechariah, the priest, is from the house of Levi. And then, obviously, John to be John the Baptist, is of the house of Levi, is the priestly line. Well, he's talking about the David line, the line of Judah, the Jews, which is the line to produce the kings, you see. And so he says a horn of salvation. Horn meaning a, it's a symbol for strength and for strength in rulership. So in other words, a strong king of salvation. Last week we talked about the shepherding, uh, king, his dominion will never end. Remember that from last week? Well, this is uh, Zechariah's proclamation of Jesus being the horn or the strong king of salvation and coming from the house of David. He's already saying this ahead of time, all right? As he said through his holy prophets of long ago. It's been long prophesied for many, many years and Zechariah is rejoicing because it has now arrived. All right. Then we're going to jump ahead to verse 76. He talks a little bit more about Jesus. But we're going to jump now ahead to his own son, John, where he says, And you, my child, he directs his attention now to his child, John. You, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. Zechariah obviously knew the prophecies about the one to prepare the way for the Messiah. And he's saying, you, my child, you're the one. You're that prophet. Which is phenomenal because it's been 400 years now since there's been a prophet. Or a king, certainly. Longer than that for a king. In Israel. And now the day has come where the long awaited prophet would come and the long awaited Messiah. And Zechariah is simply rejoicing, prophesying, probably through the Holy Spirit, maybe even not even knowing ahead of time that he's saying these things. It might be the Holy Spirit speaking them through Zechariah the priest. All right? To give his people the knowledge of salvation. That's right. When John began his preaching ministry, repentance, right, of repentance and the forgiveness of sins, well, that was going to be John's ministry, the knowledge of salvation, 
right? Through the forgiveness of their sins. Which obviously is why he said when he saw Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So this is all a preparatory. This is kind of like an Advent preparation, kind of like we're celebrating Advent leading up to eventually when we get to Christmas Eve, when we celebrate the birth of Jesus. Um, this is kind of the same idea. It's like an Advent. It's a preparing of the way of the coming of Messiah. All right? Through the forgiveness of their sins, not through the sacrificial system at the temple. This is going to be something totally different. Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, and he says rising sun, not S-O-N sun, but the actual sun, kind of like watching a sunrise. When you watch a sunrise, you go from darkness to being able to look about you and see. He's equating that kind of experience, like the dawn, like the rising of the sun, to shine on those, that's what the sun is going to do, expose, show, to shine on those living in darkness. Um, Zechariah, obviously, is referring to his own day of living in darkness around them. Darkness in terms of the, the world around them, certainly. Darkness and the shadow of death. That's the condition that Zechariah is prophesying that they certainly are in. They're in that situation of living in darkness and in the shadow of death. And this is like a dawning. This is like a, uh, a revealing, a revealing of shining on those, a rising sun. This is like a, uh, a new day, a new age. And it certainly was. So much so that even we today divide our time between BC and AD. It's a it's like a, it's like a new age, right? Before us. To guide our feet. Interesting phrase. Guide. I think of last week's message about the shepherding king, our our, our Jesus being shepherd. To guide our feet, feet, movement, direction, right? Into the path of peace into the path of peace. This is the Messiah who will come and guide us and direct us into the path of peace, right? And it will be foretold and foreshadowed, kind of like an Advent type of preparation time. That'll be foretold by John the Baptist, who will prepare the way. It's kind of a really neat um, understanding that Zechariah is receiving and is now prophesying, and we have it in Scripture today in the Gospel of Luke. So this path of peace, that's what I want to kind of use as a theme today, the path of peace. It's not just a, something peace, like something you, you just receive and hold. There's a path. There's a path. There's a walking in peace. And what does that look like? What does that look like? And I'd like to use a couple of scriptures, <clears throat> uh, one New Testament and a couple Old Testament. They're going to help us understand a little bit more about this path of peace, this way being guided into this path of peace. All right. So the first place we're going to go to talk about this is Jesus' words himself at the end of his ministry when he's getting ready to go to the cross and he's with his disciples and he's preparing them, not for his arrival, but for his departure, he's getting them ready and he's saying, I am leaving. And there had to be a level of, uh, I think, somber sadness, you know, in the room as Jesus is explaining, I'm going away. I, I go prepare a place for you, but I am going away and I will return. But there had to be this perhaps anxiousness. And that's not peace. Anxiousness is not peace. They had to be feeling a bit of fear and anxiousness themselves. So Jesus is trying to show them that he's giving them something. And it's this. 
peace I leave with you. Okay, I'm going away, but I'm going to leave peace with you. It's my peace I give to you. I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. You see, the world can't give us peace. And I probably don't have to convince you of that. If you look at our, our world, uh, I think I mentioned last week, we were never meant to be self-ruled. Uh, it doesn't work. Okay, nations don't get along with other nations. People don't get along with other people. We have human rulers. It was not, God did not intend for that. He did not design us for that. He designed us for him to be our, our God and for we to be his people. That was the design. And when, that's, when we said no, we, I, I mean humanity, obviously, it's kind of like we want to be our own God. And it hasn't worked out very well because it's not supposed to work out. It's not supposed to work. All right? It just is not. He says, peace I leave with you. It's my peace I'm giving to you. And not as the world gives because the world can't give you peace. It'll give you fear and anxiousness, but it can't really give you peace at all. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And I got a feeling in that room, in that evening, there were probably some troubled hearts as they were considering what Jesus was saying. He's leaving. There probably were some troubled hearts. Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled, okay? I'm leaving my peace with you. And do not be afraid. Uh, that phrase, do not be afraid, shows up quite a bit in Jesus' words throughout the Gospels, do not be afraid. That's what this peace is for. It's a peace so that you're not afraid and you're not going to let your hearts be troubled because he's giving us his peace. So I guess the first thought of the way we use the word peace and the way that Jesus is using the word peace in this conversation is kind of like peace of mind. I guess if you were to condense it down to one thought, peace of mind, knowing, being assured that it's going to be okay because Jesus, he's in charge, he's our savior, he's not going to leave us stranded, there's no reason for us to be afraid. Even though when we look around the world, there's lots of things to be afraid and anxious about and let our hearts be troubled, yes. But Jesus says, no, I give you my peace. Okay. I, I hope that that is real to you as it is to me. I do realize that many of us are going through some really tough things right now. Um, just tough things in life, really tough. And I do realize that it's hard to not be anxious. It's hard to not be afraid. Jesus assures us, though. He gives us his peace. So peace of mind to know that Christ is walking in life with you. is something that he wants you to hold on to. He wants you to hold on. He wanted them to hold on to it. He wants you to hold on to it, too. And he wants me to hold on to it. All right? The second one I want to show you um, is probably the more common way that we use the word peace in Scripture. And we're going to see it in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, actually the end part of chapter 52 and all of 53, is a vision. It's really a prophecy of Jesus going to the cross. It's so uh, amazing how it pictures everything that actually happened when Jesus went on the cross that um, people of the Jewish faith are, it is recommended to them that they do not read this. And that's because if you do read this, you'll begin to realize that this is picturing Jesus. And uh, 
you know, that this is the prophecy of what would happen on the cross. So in order to, to protect Judaism, they actually recommend that Jews do not read these verses. The Jews that have read these verses have come to realize Jesus really is the Messiah. It's, it's that powerful. We're just going to be reading uh, just one verse out of this whole section to describe peace the way we use it traditionally within our Christianity. Here it is, verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was pierced while he was on the cross. He was pierced, right? He was crushed for our iniquities, which means our sins, for ours. He stepped in for you to take on sin, your sin, my sin, the sin of the world. All right? The punishment that brought us peace, the punishment that we deserve, the punishment that brought us peace was on him and not on you. It's supposed to be on you. It's supposed to be on me, but it was on him. And by his wounds, this is the kind of peace we're talking about, by his wounds, we are healed. This is the kind of peace that is talked about probably more often when you talk about our Christian faith, all right? And it's the peace that represents reconciliation. The reconciliation, the bringing back together, the, the Greek word in the New Testament, the definition is certainly to, to make at one again, to bring something together again. When something is broken and brought back together, that's peace, that's making amends. It's kind of like if you break a plate and you glue it back together, you, you've made peace, you've brought it together. Um, if you have a strained relationship and there's a healing that takes place where you've brought back together people that are having conflict, that's peace. That's reconciliation. And in this case, it's reconciliation to God our Father. It's bringing humanity from the Garden of Eden to, well, a new Garden of Eden, really. A new age. An age of reconciliation. Okay, that kind of peace. And so when we think about the theme of peace today, yes, <clears throat> peace of mind is important. Don't have the fear, the troubled heart as you look around. But the peace of reconciliation is something that we are reminded of as we prepare for Jesus' coming. Because that's why he came. He came to reconcile. He came for the purpose to go to the cross. To reconcile us and bring us peace, healing. Okay? Okay. Excuse me, I've been fighting them. I don't know about you guys, there's been a lot of congestion. I've been fighting a tickle in my throat. So now when I talk, it kicks up the tickle. So I'm going to take a throat lozenger and settle it down. All right. The third place we're going to go is the chapter before, Isaiah 52. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of God speaking about the condition of that day in Isaiah's day. Isaiah was writing on behalf of God through the Holy Spirit a great warning because the people of God had turned away from God. They weren't coming back. God brought them into the promised land from Egypt. He became their God, and after a few generations, they began to turn away from God to other gods. And lots of prophets came and warned them what would happen if they did not turn back to God. And so, Isaiah certainly talks about that. And he's talking about the present condition of what's happening in chapter 52, starting in verse 4. We see this. God is speaking, for this is what the Sovereign Lord says. At first, my people went down to Egypt to live. That's right. And while they were in Egypt, of course, we know they were enslaved. We know that they were oppressed. 
So that's where his people had gone. Lately, Assyria has oppressed them. So this is like the opposite of peace, right? Assyria, at the time of this writing, was talking about the uh, current empire of Assyria taking away the northern kingdom of Israel. Israel had become two groups of people, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The kingdom of Israel in the north, the kingdom of Judah in the south. Well, because they turned away from God, God allowed Assyria to come in and take them away. And that's what he's talking about. Assyria has oppressed them. First it was Egypt. Now it's Assyria, right? And now what do I have here, declares the Lord. What's next? Well, he's going to talk talking about the kingdom of Judah being taken away. Not by Assyria, but by the next empire. This is roughly 100 years later after Assyria took the northern kingdom. It was now the kingdom of Babylon was in power. They were going to be taking away the kingdom of Judah because the people, they're not turning back to God. They've turned their backs on God. They've turned towards these other gods. Gods of wood and stone and metal and worship them. It's crazy. I mean, we think about that and think, man, I would never do that. <clears throat> well, unless you're there, in, in their time, we, we can't say that, can we? Uh, we can't say that. In their age, I'm sure that they were, whatever reasons they had, but it was kind of crazy. And God was warning them what's going to happen if you don't turn back to God. The northern kingdom's already gone to Assyria, all right? He says, for my people have been taken away for nothing. Usually when you, take, when you take people away to be slaves, you typically pay for them. But in this case, when a nation comes in and takes away people for slaves and servants, there's no payment, there's nothing. It's just nothing. They're just taken, you're stolen. Okay? My people have been taken away for nothing and those who rule them mock, declares the Lord. Those who rule them. So the Assyrians were ruling the, the uh, northern kingdom of Israel. The Babylonians, king of Babylon, was now was going to be ruling over the southern kingdom. When that happens, he's already warning them what's going to happen. He's already telling them what's going to take place. And what happens is they mock, says the Lord. And all day long, my name is constantly blasphemed. That's how they mock. What is God tell, talking about here? Well, what would happen is they would come in. I'll use Babylon as an example because we have a very good record of that. When Babylon came in and took away the kingdom of Judah and did it in three waves, three different extractions, I guess you could say, back to Babylon to be servants, slaves, and all of this. When they do that, they raid the temple. And they take all of the furnishings of the temple that are made of gold and silver, valuable things from the temple. They raid the temple. And we have, there's records of, there's even an inventory of the different things that they took from the temple. And what they do is they go back to their land with the people that they've stolen, they've taken for nothing, they go to their temple for their gods and they take the treasures from God's temple and put it in their temple and they say, see, our God is more powerful than your God. Our God has given us victory and we have defeated you and your God. So obviously our God is more powerful than your God because your God could not protect you. And so all of these Articles are used in their worship in their temple. That's exactly what they did. They took these furnishings from the temple that Solomon built to Babylon and they mocked. The final mock in, in, is recorded in the uh, book of Daniel when, is it Shel? Sh can't, I can't think of how to pronounce his name. Um, it's like the grandson of, of Nebuchadnezzar. When the handwriting on the wall, when he they, they bring in the golden goblets that were stored, they bring them in from the temple and they 
drink wine. It was, it, was a, it was like a slap in God's face. That was when the end came. That was it. That was the final straw. God stepped in. But that's how they mock. And my name is constantly blasphemed. God didn't do anything wrong. The only thing that happened is the people turned away from God. And so because of that, God allowed them to be taken away for nothing. And God is mocked by these people. Now God's going to have the final word, right? But for a time, he is mocked. All right? Therefore, verse 6, my people will know my name. They don't know it now, but there's a day coming when they will know my name. The interesting thing about these prophecies that God gives warnings and the prophets that warn them about what's going to happen to them, the interesting thing is, even though God talks about disaster, he talks about what's going to happen, and it's going to be pretty bad, but God always looks at the other side. He looks at, okay, beyond the disaster. When you get done with the disaster, here's what it's going to be like when I bring you back. And God was very much about giving the people hope before the disaster so that when it came after the disaster, they would recognize it. They would recognize it. He always talked about, yes, it's going to be bad. Yes, there's disaster coming. But on the other side of that, boy, do I have something big planned. And this is what he says. Therefore, there's a double therefore. Look at that. Therefore, in that day, they will know that it is I who foretold it. They're going to look back and say, you know what? God warned us about this. They're going to know his name, the name of the Lord. And they're going to recognize that God had already foretold what was going to happen. And just to do a little I, victory dance of some kind that God is saying here, he doubles down and he says this, yes, it is I. <laughs> I love that. He repeats, yep, it is I, your God. Not these wooden gods, stone gods that are nothing. Wood and stone was created by the Almighty. He's, God is actually mocking the other gods and the other systems at this point. Because they're going to know my name. That day is coming. See, God's looking beyond the disaster, saying that day is coming. And when we get to verse 7, there's a little celebration here. And this is where peace comes in. Maybe you're wondering, okay, Pastor Grant, where are we getting to the peace? Well, here's where the peace comes in. When that day comes, when we get beyond the disaster, something is wonderful is going to happen. And this is what he says. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those, the feet of those who bring good news. Good news. Another word for good news is gospel, right? There's a day coming, God says. It's in the future, yes. And they will know my name, yes. And they will know that I foretold this, yes. And that it is I. But he says, how beautiful that's going to be on the mountains. People are going to climb mountains to make this happen. Kind of a a visual of to get over to the other place, you're going to have to climb a mountain to do it. Okay, we'll do it. The feet of those, the feet, path, walk, forward. The feet of those who bring good news. There's good news coming, and there's going to be people who are going to bring that good news that are going to know my name, he says, who proclaim peace. Yeah, they're going to proclaim peace, reconciliation. There's something else coming that's going to reinforce this thought of peace here. Okay, it's coming up. Who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings. It's kind of like the crown, the, crown, the town crier who's 
on making these announcements, wonderful, good announcements called tidings, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation. Zechariah was proclaiming salvation, wasn't he? In his, it was almost like a song he was singing in a way. It was his speech, a prophetic speech of the coming Messiah. And that John, his son, you my child, he says, are going to prepare the way for him. Who proclaim salvation. It's tied to peace, isn't it? Who say to Zion, your God reigns. The God, you know his name now. You know his name. And I foretold it, God says. And the day's coming when you're going to know your God reigns. It might not seem like it for a while. And when you look around our landscape of our nation and the world, um, it might not be apparent to many that God reigns, but he does. We saw last week when we talked about hope, we saw how Jesus is already king over the kings of the earth. They just don't know it yet, right? He's coming one day to, to claim that when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That day's coming. But <clears throat> there's going to be a day when you will climb mountains if necessary in order to bring good news, to proclaim the peace the reconciliation, who proclaim salvation, yeah, reconciliation, who say your God reigns. That kind of peace is almost like peace of mind in a way, isn't it? To be able to say your God reigns. Make it personal. My God reigns. Being able to say my God reigns. We say that all, we say, okay, God is in charge. Can you truly say my God reigns? Yeah, there's lots of crazy stuff going on. And the world is not going to give you peace. There's no peace. We weren't meant to. Peace comes from God. But when you recognize, my God reigns. Say that with me. My God reigns. Boy, there's peace of mind. You know, when you... When you proclaim peace, you proclaim it and it becomes really clear when you're in times when there does not seem to be peace. And you got people that are reacting to that. And then you have this believer over here who says, no, 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 my God reigns. Your God reigns too. Your God reigns. That's proclaiming. You're proclaiming it with your life. Sometimes you use words. <laughs> There's a, when you're around somebody who's, who believes that God reigns, there's a different feel, isn't there? It's like the Spirit of God is just kind of there. Even if you don't know what that is, it's, you know that that person, there's something different. And that person inside or outside is saying, my God reigns. Yeah, I'm going to proclaim peace. I'm going to proclaim salvation. This is peace that comes from saying, your God reigns. The God, you know his name now. You know he's proclaimed this ahead of time for you. And now you can say, my God reigns. This kind of peace, this is the peace that we can proclaim. Yes, there's a peace of mind. Because we know that our God reigns. There's the peace of reconciliation. Proclaiming salvation. And Zechariah was kind of all about that in his beautiful speech. that He'd waited nine months to give because he couldn't talk. But as soon as John the Baptist was born, he was suddenly now able to talk, right? And he proclaimed, didn't he? Can you proclaim? Can we proclaim with our ways, our path of peace, our walk, our feet. 
says, beautiful on the mountain are the feet. You know, that would imply that maybe it won't be that easy, right? But it's true to be able to say, my God reigns. And whatever people throw at you that are critics or doubters, you know, great answer is, my God reigns. <laughs> How do you argue with that, right? How do you argue with that? So when we talk about peace, like I started out saying, there's, there's a couple ways we can look at peace, and we've seen a couple today, right? The verses that just come back to us, certainly Luke with Zechariah saying, one day there's going to be shining in darkness. And actually, in his day, there was shining in darkness. There was revealing of Jesus, right? And the shadow of death, right? The shine on those living in darkness, and we can say that today. There's lots of darkness, but the light, when it shines, it automatically overcomes the darkness, doesn't it? The truth of God will overcome darkness. And in the shadow of death, yeah, isn't it amazing and wonderful that Jesus has defeated death, because he has, to guide our feet, our shepherding king, Jesus, to guide our feet. It's not even that we have to figure out the path, okay? We don't have to figure out the path. Jesus will guide our feet into the path of peace, his peace, right? Remember what he said in John 14? He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give, I give you. He's giving you his peace. It comes from him. It doesn't come from the world, okay? Not as the world gives, right? It's peace from Christ. And even though we're looking forward to as an, in an Advent way, which means arrival, we're looking forward to the birth of Jesus as we celebrate it, even right now. It's not like we have to wait. It's here now. Jesus has already given you his peace. He doesn't want you to be anxious. He doesn't want you to be fearful. He doesn't want your heart to be troubled. He's giving you his peace. It's a gift from him. All right? Jesus is our peace. Just like Jesus is our hope from last week, Jesus is our peace. And he's left his peace until he comes. Last week we kind of talked about his coming and the hope of his coming. But until he does, he gives us his peace. He says, my peace I give you. He wants you to not be afraid and not be anxious. And I know it's hard. Look, look we, we face some really difficult things. We just do. I get that. Jesus gets that. But he want, doesn't want your heart to be troubled. He wants you to say, my God reigns. No matter what's happening, even if I lose my life, you know what? My God reigns. And when you live by that, not only is it giving you peace of mind, not only are you proclaiming salvation, you are walking a path of peace. And people see that, and it becomes a testimony to them. It's a witness. Why aren't, why aren't you freaking out when everybody else is freaking out? Yeah, it's a testimony to the peace of Christ. Okay? And that's something we celebrate here at Christmas time as we uh, look at the arrival of Jesus and what it means. Next week we'll go to the next theme and we'll talk a little bit more about his actual birth and why it was such an important thing. Why did Jesus have to be born? Why couldn't he just arrive you know, from the clouds? His first coming. He had to be born. Why is that? We'll talk a little bit more about that next week. But for right now, hang on to the hope of his coming, soon coming. We don't know when, but we are waiting for him. We're looking, not, not watching signs and being all caught up in signs. You know, that's a big thing today is uh, we're looking at signs. Well, 
we can be so busy looking at signs that we're ignoring how we're supposed to live. We're not supposed to be so much watching that way, but waiting. Waiting is different. It's we're going to uh, be Christ's hands and feet until he comes. And we're going to say, my God reigns. And we're going to proclaim peace. Does that sound like a good idea? I hope so. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the arrival of Jesus. His future arrival, we're looking forward to very, very much. Bringing peace to this earth. But until that happens, Father, we recognize that the only peace on this earth is the peace of your son, Jesus. That your son, Jesus, gives to us so that we can have peace and so that we can proclaim peace in our lives. We can proclaim salvation and we can pro proclaim, Father, that my God, which is you, Father, reign. You are King and Lord. Jesus is our Lord and King. So, Father, we give you praise today and we thank you for what you are revealing to us. And we ask certainly that more and more people will be able to see and recognize that same revelation in their lives as well. We pray that, Father, for all of our loved ones and friends. And Father, as we move closer to Christmas Eve, would you bless us with your son and his peace and the hope of his coming. It's in the name of Jesus, our shepherd king, certainly in Jesus, our peace, we pray. Amen. Amen. Wow. Well, hey, today is uh, Communion Sunday. It is first Sunday of the month. Um, if you want to pause the video to get your elements, you can do that. And then come on back, or if you have them ready. Um, I want to go to, uh, this month I want to go back to this verse as we do Communion of Isaiah 53 because it's a powerful statement of reconciliation. And that's what we're reminded of. We're reminded of this. Okay? But he was pierced for our transgressions. That's right. Your sins, my sins, have been covered because he was pierced. He was crushed for our iniquities. Right? The punishment that should have been ours, the punishment that brought us peace, reconciliation, and I would say peace of mind as a result, right? It was on him. It was supposed to be on us. It was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. That's the kind of peace we're talking about today. And we can certainly have peace of mind and we can proclaim that, right? Well, you know what? When we take communion, we're proclaiming that. We are. We're proclaiming that. Remember when Paul was giving us the words of communion and, and explaining how he had received it from Jesus himself. And he said afterwards, at the end, he says, every time you do this, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Remember that? So we're proclaiming the Lord's death. We're actually proclaiming peace, salvation, reconciliation. Okay? So the body of Christ represented by the bread is the taking in of Jesus. And really neat thing about this, when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, the really neat thing is we are reminded each and every time we take this and we declare the death of Christ in our lives, we're reminded that my God reigns. Your God reigns. We're taking in Jesus. He gives us our peace. Well, he gives us of himself. And we're reminded of that each and every time that we take these elements. And so let's be reminded today. Father, would you bless the bread today? Would you allow us to understand? Would you allow us to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes? With this small reminder, but yet, Father, powerful, powerful statement of reconciliation and peace and salvation. Father, we, we proclaim that. By taking this and we remember Jesus, would you bless our, our remembrance, our understanding, that it would sink deep in our hearts, Father, the very peace of Christ. It's in the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen.
body of Christ. The cup. Yeah, the reconciliation, the covering of our sins. It's all been done. 2,000 years ago, your sins were forgiven. Back then, they were forgiven. Yeah, we still get to live out the consequences of our bad choices, our sins. We do. But Jesus has covered them. He's reconciled us. And this is the reminder of that. We need to be reminded. We need to be reminded and we need to rejoice. And we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And this cup helps us to do that. Father, would you bless the cup today? And as we take it, Father, we proclaim the Lord's death. And we proclaim that we are clean and washed only by the blood of Jesus. That's only the only way that it can be. And we proclaim that peace, that reconciliation through this cup. So, Father, bless it as we remember in the name of Jesus, our high priest and our Savior, the sacrifice we pray. Amen. The cup of Christ. It's a beautiful thing. I hope that this Christmas season is a season of... <clears throat> I hope it's a season of rejoicing for you. Many times Christmases are times of being anxious. Uh, sometimes we make ourselves busy by doing things or having to do all these things that we think we have to be done and, and we don't take the time to think about, to meditate on the peace of Christ and the reconciliation of Christ and what it all means. Okay, I hope that you're able to take time to do that this season, okay? Please take the time to do that. Read Matthew, the first, first two chapters, and Luke, the first two chapters. You get a good feel for the birth of Christ told in the gospel messages, all right? And if you've got any questions, give me a call. love to talk to you. Send me an email, anything like that. I'd love to do that, okay? <clears throat> and uh, what else was I going to tell you? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. We, we're doing, um, just so you know, so you're aware, on our uh, indoor in-person services on the first Sunday of the month, we do a potluck. And so uh, we share a meal after church. So, hey, come on out one of these times and join us. Uh, maybe that would be something that would be interesting to you. The other thing that's coming up is this Wednesday at 6 o'clock here at the church. So that's December 8th. Uh, we have uh, Sheriff Matt King coming out to the church, and he's going to talk to us about um, scams and frauds and thefts and things that they're seeing here in our area. They're going to tell us how we can protect ourselves against some of these things. Um, so that's 6 o'clock on uh, this Wednesday night, December 8th. If that's interesting to you, come on out and... Uh, and listen to the sheriff as he explains what's going on in the community around us. Uh, not to bring fear and anxiousness, but just to bring wisdom and, and how we can uh, combat against some of these things that are coming at us. Okay? All right. I'll leave you with a song. This song is kind of reflective of that Isaiah 52 verse <clears throat> that celebrates how beautiful on the mountain are the feet of those who bring good news. This song is kind of a little bit after that. It's uh, words like, go tell it on the mountain, if you've heard that. It's a Christmas song. That Jesus Christ is born. How's that for proclaiming peace? Jesus is born. God sent us salvation that blessed Christmas more. Okay, what a beautiful picture. Those are the kind of things we can think about as we prepare for Christmas. Yes, I know. There's gifts and there's getting together and there's <clears throat> all these things that might be happening in your home, please take the time to celebrate Christ, all right? God bless you and keep you, keep you safe, and uh, may his grace shine upon you this coming week. And God willing, we'll see you next week. All right. Go tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere go 
tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching o'er silent flocks by night, behold, throughout the heavens there shone a holy light. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. The shepherds feared and trembled when low above the earth. Rang out the angel chorus that hailed the Savior's birth. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. The humble Christ was born And God sent us salvation That blessed Christmas morn Go tell it on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain That Jesus Jesus Christ is born Go tell it on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ is born Go Tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born.